Welcome back to reel three of the Vintage Record Auction 74 Highlights Reel Series. Uh, this reel is going to encompass the various musical genres that we offer in the catalog uh, with some of the higher minimum bid uh, and some of the more interesting records to be found in uh, this particular auction. The auction closes October 21st. But you do have until the following Thursday to get your bids in, just in case you happen to be running behind. Please do not wait. It really puts a lot of stress on us here at Fort Knox trying to get all those bids entered uh, into the auction so we can get things closed and get preliminary invoices out to our bidders uh, that weekend. Uh, we've got an awful lot to do, so the earlier you can get your bids in, the better it is for all of us. And it get, does you absolutely no good to put your bids in at the last minute. Nobody knows your bid or anybody else's. They don't know any more than you do, which is nothing in terms of what the bids are like or whether or not you're high or whether or not you're going to win or whatever. So get them in early and uh, we will very much appreciate that. It'll get you into our good graces. And it should be, uh, go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. When we have a tie bid, which we often have... Uh, tie bids, um, the, the bid received first gets the record. So that is one distinct advantage of bidding early. All right, we are going to start off with the opera uh, recordings and uh, we're going to begin with a series of Crusoe Zonophones. A little story behind these records. Crusoe recorded seven uh, Zonophone recordings for the Anglo-Italian Commerce Company in Italy. They were issued uh, on the Zonophone label um, under the auspices of the AICC. And uh, later, when uh, the Gramophone Company purchased Zonophone, uh, they, the labels didn't change, but the back of them, instead of having an AICC uh, backplate, uh, had a Zonophone backplate. So uh, that's how you can tell the difference there. Other than that, there's no, no real difference. Same music, same label. But the International Zonophone Company label uh, had a, a light blue label for some of their more important artists. Both uh, light blue and orange were used. And uh, all the Crusoe's came out on the light blue, la blue label. All of these seven records I'm about to show to you came from the Caruso Museum in Brooklyn, New York. A museum that was founded by Aldo Mancuso. Or, uh, Mancuso? Mancusi? Mancusi, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, Aldo Mancusi in Brooklyn, uh, I've been to his, uh, museum several times. He was a great guy. Uh, I bought a lot of stuff from him over the years, but he would never sell anything out of the Caruso collection. But he passed away, uh, a year or so ago and his, uh, daughter, uh, wasn't able to continue to run the museum. She had her own family and, uh, work and so forth to deal with. So all of that was liquidated. Uh, I came in and bought... Uh, much of the really high-end stuff. And uh, included uh, amongst that was a complete set of the Crusoe Zonophones. Unfortunately, those Zonophones had been hanging on the wall for years. And uh, apparently this one had not been hanging on the wall as long as this one had. You can see how that light blue label fades. And then in the middle you see what the blue label actually originally looked like because they had a washer there so that when he screwed it down the screw wouldn't you know chip the the record or something so uh, so you can see what it used to look like right there in the middle uh, these would normally be two thousand dollar twenty five hundred dollar records we've sold caruso zonophones as much as four or five thousand in really beautiful shape uh, so they are very desirable, expensive, and rare discs. Uh, but because primarily of the label situation, and also that uh, they're not the, the highest condition uh, copies out there groove-wise either, we have these things priced down to a very low $250 per record. I can guarantee you they will all sell. Uh, so you can bid on these records individually, $250 minimum bid, or you can bid on them as an entire lot. And I think that the lot bid on these is $2,500. Uh, while I'm talking, Raquel is going to look that up. And she will let us know precisely what the minimum bid on the Caruso Zonophones are. So because of their importance, I'm just going to flip through them so you can get an idea of what the, uh, what the label 
uh, situation is. So we're all here. I'm spent sitting uh, here the whole time talking about Crusoe Zonophones, and I wound up put it, pulling up a different light blue Zonophone. Uh, Tina Bendazzi Caruli. Uh, is this particular zone phone lot number 1413 minimum bid $100 so uh, this is lot number 1462 okay $2,000 for the complete set you can see that the uh, the label itself isn't bad it's got some little scratches on it but pretty nice other than the color pretty much same for this one this is one of the rare uh, of the seven Luna Fidel lot number 1463 1464 looks like that uh, uh, earlier one that I was showing. This uh, isn't faded nearly as bad, but it's still faded. 1465. This one has the AICC backplate, so you can see that pretty clearly. Anglo-Italian Commerce Company, Genoa, and uh, Mil Milan. This one has the Zonophone backplate. So this would be a later pressing than the one that we just looked at. And you can see it's got a couple of little uh, pressure cracks, which is why somebody has put tape on the back. And that's what that looks like. Okay. All told, John Bolig, the Crusoe discographer, estimates that uh, well under 10,000 uh, pressings were made of all seven of these. So all seven press runs put together uh, would still be under 10,000. So there were not very many made. That would be lot number 1467 for La Donna Mobile. 1468, so that's number seven. Okay. Uh, by the way, the ring that I'm wearing here is Caruso's Pinky Ring, which I picked up at the museum. Uh, I also paid for it. I didn't just pick it up. Um, but uh, I thought it would be nice to uh, wear Caruso's ring as I'm going through his Zonos. All right. Lot number 1517, Leopold Damut, $50 minimum bid on uh, a black GNT. Here is... We, we looked at the uh, uh, Gramophone Red Seal Record 7-inch pressing at the beginning of the video series. Here we have the 10-inch counterpart to that, Gramophone Concert Records. They don't call this Red Seal. You don't see those words on here, but this is another example of a early flush label Russian red labeled pressing for their celebrity vocal series. This is by Nikolai Finyar and dating from uh, probably from pretty close to when uh, those things were introduced in December of 01 or early 02. Here's uh, Eugenio Giraldoni, uh, lot number 1563 for a $100 minimum bid, kind of label rubs on that. Heinrich Hansel, lot number 1588 for a $100. Roxy King, Lot 1608. I think we may have played this on the show. We played about 170 records, so it's hard for me to remember exactly what got played and what didn't. Uh, $50 minimum bid on the Roxy King. Uh, Leon Lafitte. A lot 1617. $50 minimum bid. A uh, lot number 1626. Felia Litvin. Uh, $100 minimum bid on that. I'm pretty sure we played that one. Uh, Monsieur Renault, lot number 1733 for a $100 opener. And another one of his, kind of a water damage label for $50 minimum bid, 1734. Here's a Becca Grand record by uh, Max de Groot on uh, violin, $50. Now we're going to go into uh, our pop stuff. Here's uh, Baby Rosemary on Brunswick. V plus, some uh, label tears. Not the greatest uh, condition in the world. Therefore, a $50 minimum bid. Here's a $100 minimum bid on lot number 3698. Uh, hey There, May There by George M. Cohan. One of the handful of victors that he made in the teens. Uh, one of the rarest of those. 
Oh, this is a, one of my favorite records, the Ink Spots on Victor Scroll. They did two Victor Scrolls. These were their first commercially issued recordings. Uh, $50 minimum bid, bid on that. Your feet's too big. I'm not talking to you, Raquel. Satan, uh, Satan's Little Lamb by uh, Ethel Merman. $50 minimum bid on that. Uh, here's a Sophie Tucker record in beautiful condition, which we played on the show. Uh, another Sophie Tucker okay. Uh, all right. We have in this particular auction uh, two gym quality sections. One is our regular gym quality section that you're familiar with. It has a, all kinds of different labels. But we also have another uh, selection. And that will be found on page... On page... 57, the Gym Quality Pathé Perfect Issues. So a man walked into my shop here in Houston a number of years ago, and he says, I've got all these records that belong to one of my relatives, and uh, are you interested in them? Well, his relative was a guy by the name of Tom uh, Murphy, who was an executive with a Pathé company. And Mr. Murphy was getting a free copy of all the different records that were being pressed, or at least some of them. I'm not sure how they would have determined which ones he got and which ones he didn't. But we got, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred different records, maybe more, of uh, brand new, unplayed, Pathé and Perfect label recordings, including some very uh, rare issues from the early 1930s. And when I say unplayed, I, I really mean unplayed. Like here's, here's one right here, for example. This is Cliff Edwards and the Eaton Boys doing St. Louis Blues. E plus, minimum bid $50, but I don't think a stylus has ever hit that record. And most of these records have a, a nice, crisp, original sleeve with it. I mean, that's perfect. Nobody's written on them or anything. Uh, they're flat. They're not faded. They're not stained or torn. Uh, these are truly dealer stock records. And uh, so, yeah, heck yeah, I'm interested in those records. So I bought them. And then they got they sat on the shelf for years before this auction when I finally decided it's time to clear some space like Raquel and I were talking about earlier. And we started and we uh, uh, put these things together and listed them. A lot of them are perfects like this. There are certainly some pathes. There are some other records that came in it which were also just amazing. Here is an example of one of those in the current auction list. This is a 16-inch Pathé. We saw one earlier that was a French Pathé. This is a 16-inch American Pathé. The white and black Pathé Actuelle label. Look at the sleeve. That is amazing. Again, it's basically new. It's got a few little tears at the bottom. Here's the flip side. I mean, these, these records were, I don't know if they were unplayed, but they, they were in beautiful shape. This particular one grades E minus E plus with the original sleeve. Just a gorgeous, wonderful record. And uh, I had never even seen sleeves for these things until this guy walked in the, uh, in, into the uh, shop. This has only a $200 minimum bid on it. It's slot number 4280. Another thing that uh, was really cool that uh, he walked uh, in with as part of that lot was this. Tell me if you've ever seen one of these before. You don't really tell, need to tell me because you haven't. This is another pattern label which was done for uh, the May Radio and Television Corporate, uh, Corporation, distributors of Philco Radio. Look at that, Stardust by Cab Calloway and his orchestra. The reason I know that this was a uh, pattern label is not only the fact that this is a label that is unknown, um, nobody's seen one of these before, but also because the labels do not match what's in the grooves. This is a mock-up. That Rexall label we saw earlier did match, but this one does not. Uh, I forget what's actually on this record. You'll see it in the catalog. It's lot number uh, 4274. 
and the recordings on here are from November 4th, 1931. So a lot of the stuff that Big Eye walked in with was from 1931-32. Great Depression era personality and ba dance band material. And all in this same kind of condition. So, again, if you're a label collector, you buy this record, you will be the only one on the block, uh, if not the world, to own a copy of that particular label. All right, so here we have lot number 4277, which is a packing slip uh, that came with the records that lists all the different numbers that he got in this particular shipment all checked off. Uh, records, perfect, uh, sent out of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, so that's just a little documentation on that. There were also... Uh, a couple of other things that I should mention. A lot of these records came in original boxes and uh, I'll show you what those look like. Unfortunately they're not anything particularly special but I will sell them or give them away to uh, bidders on these uh, on these records as the supplies last but it's just uh, a simple little box like that nothing special no writing or information on them but uh but they came in these or a lot of them did and then there was also a uh flyer here that uh somebody's going to have interest in this is a uh, bing crosby uh guy lombardo flyer 25 cents now 25 cents perfect records and uh here we have the back of that so, uh, unfortunately, there was not a lot of paper. It would have been nice if he'd come in with stacks of posters and paper and promo materials and so forth. That was not the case. Got, got a little bit of it, but not much. Okay, so that, uh, that's the section you're going to look, want to look at. The gem, quality, perfect, and pathé record uh, category. We played probably two or three or four of those on the Bitter Request Show. Here is a record out of our sacred uh, category. This is on the Canto Gregoriano label. Uh, this is a gramophone company pressing and uh, featuring Alessandro Moreschi, a castrato. If I happen to have been a castrato, I would be talking like this because that's what happens when you perform that procedure on someone. He was the only castrato to have made a recording so not only is it just an interesting recording anyway but it's historically significant that was a practice that was discontinued in the 19th century but he lived long enough to make uh, some of these recordings okay here is another uh, Moreschi uh, recording on the same label only on this one he's conducting he is not singing I don't know what the sound of a castrato conducting sounds like compared to another person. I will have to listen to that to find out. Okay. You wouldn't know, would you, Raquel? No. Okay. Lot number 4360. Grinnell Giggers uh, for $75. This is a uh, uh, country thing. We played this on the show. A uh, Grinnell is a type of fish. And uh, so those were people who would go out with their uh, three-pronged spear to uh, a gig Grinnell fish. That's where that name comes from. Here is a um, $100 minimum bid on a Palmer McCabe uh, harmonica solo. $250 minimum bid on $45.95. Do Law Do by Ida Cox. Here's Delta Joe, lot number 4598 on the Chance label for $200. Uh, lot number 4600, $100 for Mary Dixon on a Columbia recording. Looks like one, perhaps $100 or 150 I can't read that. 4607, Lillian Glenn, very, very beautiful Columbia, E minus condition. Clarence Williams with Katherine Henderson on the vocal, $75 minimum bid, lot number 4613 on the QRS label. From there we go to 
Sonny Boy Holmes. I've got the $64 Question Blues. Number 4618 for $100. I was going to play this on a bid request show, but we uh, neglected to catch it in time. Lot number 4622, Alberta Hunter Sugar. A pretty common record, but not in any condition. $75 minimum bid. Here's a recording that uh, somebody will be interested in. Lot number 4625 for $1,000 minimum. That is a Black Patty recording of Frankie Half Pint Jackson. Uh, this is a second one of this particular uh, Black Patty issue that we've had over the last uh, few recent years. Lot number 4642 for $250 is the Memphis Jug Band. Stay, she stays out all night long. I think it's time to find somebody else. What do you think, Raquel? Sounds about right. Uh, lot number 4668, $75, Bessie Smith, from the flag label Columbia. Here's a $100 minimum on Spivey and Gray, got to have what it takes on Victor Scroll. Uh, lot number 4695, Trumpet label 4722 for Sonny Boy Williamson, $50. Seventy-five bucks on the Bucktown Five, Jeanette, forty-eight ten. You know, a lot of these things you'll find when you get records uh, from us. You'll find that uh, sometimes the information over here is scratched out, other stuff written in. Um, the reason for that typically is because after an end of an auction, we have a lot of unsolds. Uh, well, not a lot of unsolds. About five percent of the auction is unsold. So all of those uh, records eventually will come out of those sleeves, and those sleeves will get to, will will become reused because uh, why not? They're nice, serviceable just discophile sleeves. So when you see that going on, that does not mean necessarily that this is a record that has been run in a catalog before. Now sometimes that is the case. Very, it, it's, it's very seldom actually that we run old auction lots, but occasionally we do. Uh, in which case, yeah, we'll leave them in the original sleeve. But most of the time, when you see a sleeve that uh, has stuff crossed out, it's simply because we had a different record in there at one time. Or because I bought a record collection. Of course, every day, every year that goes by, I buy record collections. More and more of those collections are housed in discophiles because, uh, you know, I've been selling them now for 20 years and we've sold, I don't know, a couple million of them. And so you're going to find discophiles all over the world. And so we will reuse those sleeves also. All right, lot number 4830, $100 minimum bid for Celestine's original Tuxedo Jazz Orchestra. Ta-ta, baby. Lot 4872, a DECA label champion by Charlie Davenport. Chimes Blues and Atlanta Rag. Rockin' in Rhythm, Harlem Foot Warmers, $5,250 minimum bid. I think we've played that on a bitter request show in the past. There's a Richard M. Jones Jazz Wizards Victor for a $50 minimum bid. To be followed by Little Chocolate Dandies, $100 minimum bid. Six or seven times, lot number 5156. We played a record four or five times uh, during the show. This one is six or seven times. I think people would probably quit listening after you played it six or seven times. I don't know. Maybe not that record. All right. $100 minimum bid, Bunny Maroff, $52.19, $52.29. A uh, Deep Harlem record by Irving Mills and his Totsy Totsy Band. This was a, re a pick in the Bitter Request show by a man who came by here a couple of months ago and um, had a very interesting Bitter Request show story. And so I asked him if he would be interested in or willing to be on the Bitter Request show to tell his story. And he agreed. And so he is on uh, BRS 74, where he introduces this record, because this was his pick. And um, 
uh, you uh, will hear him if you buy the show or if you listen to the broadcast either way. Uh, very nice gentleman and uh, some very gratifying things that he had to say. I think you may have met him when he was here, Raquel. I did. And I heard part of his story before the show. Cool. All right, $52.62, $100 minimum bid for Curtis Mosby and his Dixieland Blue Blowers on Columbia 40,001. That is a rare record out of the 40,000 series, and it only has a $100 minimum bid. That record is going to do pretty well. All right, $150 minimum bid for Benny Moten's Boot It, lot 5276. And here's a Mound City Blue Blowers, $75 minimum bid for Tailspin Blues. And lot number 5311. Unfortunately, only in V condition. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. This is a Jeanette by King Oliver and his Creole Jazz Band Crooked Blues. That is a very, very desirable record. Even in V condition, we've got a $100 minimum bid on it. If it was an E plus condition, you would probably be looking at $5,000 plus. So that is a record somebody's going to want. I can guarantee you that will not sell for $100. Uh, $100 minimum bid, Tiny Parham's Snake Eyes, E minus, lot 5345. Uh, let's see here. A couple of uh, Edison Needle Cuts, Piccadilly Players Breakaway. $50 minimum bid, 53.53 is a lot number on that. $100 minimum bid on Rock Me Mama by Banjo Ike Robinson and his Bull Fiddle Band. That's lot number 53.99 on a Lightning Bolt Brunswick. Here is another Edison Needle Cut, B.A. Rolf, the Flippity Flop, $50 minimum bid. That's lot 54.01. Here's 54.02, another needle cut by uh, B.A. Rolf, also a $50 minimum. Here's a $100 minimum by the 7-gallon jug band on lot number 5420, a very nice Columbia pressing there. Frankie Trumbauer, $75 for $54.73. 5490 Fats Waller, the Fats Waller Stomp, $75 minimum bid on that. $100 for Pepper Steak, Washboard Rhythm Boys. Uh, lot number 5506, we played that on the show. And we played a, you know, there are a number of things that uh, we played on the show that have not turned up. Where is that uh, True Tone OK out of the label section of Big Butter and Eggman by... Uh, May Alex and Louis Armstrong's Hot Five. Maybe I flipped through it and didn't notice it. Maybe you guys have already seen it in uh, Real One, but uh, that's around somewhere, and it's a beautiful record. 5581, Fess Williams on a True Tone OK for 75. $200 minimum bid on Sid Williams, Piano Solo, My Pet. Lot number 5586. Nice E condition record there. 5641. M minus. Everybody's Fishing by Amos Eastern, Easton on a, a really nice M minus bluebird. Let's see what an M minus bluebird looks like. As you know, M minus is the highest grade that we can. Uh, assigned to a record and it basically means that it looks like it could have been made this morning and that one pretty much does $150 minimum bid okay so we are now into our gym quality section gym quality section recordings must have a grade that is no lower than E minus with no significant defects. So this for instance is an E copy 
uh, $50 minimum bid, lot 5644. Uh, it has a little A right there on the label, so a very small WOL. Not a big deal. Looks like this record has two A sides. Somebody probably was uh, denoting their preference for the tunes, and they probably liked both of them a lot. Which is understandable since that's Bernard Addison and his rhythm. We played this Bernard Addison record on the Bitter Request show, and this is uh, I Can't Dance. You know why I can't dance? Okay. Why? Because I got ants in my pants. Oh. Yeah, that'll do it. That will do it. Actually, that could actually make you dance, yeah. I'm thinking. But, you know. Not well, though. Not. <laughs> I don't know. The way I see people dance these days, it'd probably be pretty good. Fifty-six eighty-one, fifty dollars $50 for whatever that is. Duke Ellington is famous... Orchestra Blue Harlem, that's what that is. Okay, so here we are back with a fresh crate of Jim Quality Records. $57.10, $100 for Johnny Dunn on a uh, flag label Columbia. Another $100 for the Cotton Club Orchestra flag label. $57.13 is a lot number. His records I'm passing up are by no means bad records. They're just lower value, and these shows go long enough as it is. Mills Blue Rhythm Band, $100 for $57.43. Nice Blue Wax Columbia for those of you new collectors out there who've never seen what one of those looks like. Uh, Columbia introduced the Blue Wax uh, material during the uh, early years of the Depression in an effort to boost sales. And I don't know if it boosted sales or not, but they sure are beautiful records. And uh, they sound good. They're a little prone to laminations, like all uh, Columbia laminated pressings are. A lot of times those, uh, those laminations don't even sound. So it's not necessarily an issue. Here's uh, Vic Burton, Blue Axe Columbia, $75 for that one. $57.48. Here's $150 for a Joven Nudie. Uh, $57.49. $100 for Clarence Williams Jazz Kings on an E minus Columbia, lot number 5754. Lot number 5793 is a DECA by Memphis Mini, When You're Asleep, from 1935. $150 minimum bid on a Sunburst label. We played that on the show. 5793. 5795 is a Carl Martin DECA. We played that on the show as well. $250 minimum bid. $100 for this Electra Disc by Sid Pelton and his orchestra. $100 uh, minimum uh, with, a fit, with 5798 uh, lot number. Uh, what's special about this is its original sleeve. You don't see Electra Disc uh, original sleeves every day, but you see one here. Very, very nice copy of that. Uh, Good condition sleeves can be obviously very hard to find. Good condition sleeves of very rare record labels are particularly hard to find. So that is why we have a $100 minimum on jig time. Not that it wouldn't be worth a lot of money anyway, just as the record, because being a uh, E condition electro disc of a really nice hot little dance band number, uh, that makes it quite desirable. Okay, here's a red Jeanette of the Rocky Mountain Trio doing Grand Opera Blues for a $100 minimum bid. E condition, $57.99. Oh boy, this, uh, this record. This record is 
the last record I played in the Bitter Request Show. It is amazing. Lot number 5802, $300 minimum bid, recorded in 1929. This is Pat Dollahan and his orchestra. Maybe this is love on a beautiful Electro Beam Jeanette. In E condition. That's a record. All right, $100 minimum bid on Baron Lee and his Blue Rhythm Band with Billy Banks on the vocal. 5813 is the lot number. Reefer Man. You know what that means? You know what a Reefer Man is, Raquel? No. Really? No? Really. C can't guess? I have a few guesses. You see. Oh, you're right. All right, Bessie Jackson, Sloppy Drunk Blues on Melotone, 5814. Uh, 750 minimum bid on that. I think that's Lucille Bogan. Uh, Mississippi Sheik, slot number 5826 for $250 minimum. Interesting thing about this record, this is OK8784, Sing on Top of the World, which was uh, certainly one of their more popular numbers, if not the most popular, but... Um, same selection on both sides. And uh, sometimes you'll see that for a jukebox uh, record, so that typically a jukebox record will have one side worn out and then the other side unplayed because nobody wants to hear the flip side. So if you put the same tune on both sides and you get double the life out of the record, of course that's not get great for the record company because they're only selling one copy of the record instead of two. So I'm not sure what the reason was for putting it on both sides. Maybe it was a mistake. That's always possible. But it is a little bit early to be uh, looking at that in light of a jukebox. Okay, $58.24, $50 minimum bid, Clarinet Tickle by Boyd Center. Here's a $100 minimum on uh, Leroy Abbott, $58.29. Uh, Mark writes on this, wow. $50 minimum bid for WOW, 5834. He's referring to its condition. M minus. Does that look pretty good to you? That's gorgeous. Does that just glisten like a diamond? Mm hmm. It just makes you want to listen to it. You know, I mean, who cares what it is? When you see a record in that shape, you just want to listen to it. $250 minimum bid for Sam Manning, the Bargy. The Bargy? A West Indian uh, deal, 200, uh, lot number 5892. Yeah, I don't know what uh, Bargy means. This is not a record we played on the Bitter Request show, but we could have. We can always listen to it and find out. Okay. Okay, what do we have here? <laughs> wow. Uh, Bill Brown on Varsity with a minimum bid of $50. I'm not even sure where we have a lot number on this. Um, in a collector sleeve. Sometimes guys go to so much trouble with their uh, records, it's kind of, you feel guilty throwing that away. I mean, how long did it take him to put all that together? Plus, you get the, the requisite record collector cat picture on the back. Of course, you're not a record collector if you don't have 18 cats crawling all over the place. Or so it would seem. Christmas 1991. Uh, so apparently somebody gave him this. Perhaps. That's sweet. Alright, moving right along. Oh, we played this record on the show. That's This is amazing. I shouldn't even be selling it. Stop That Band by the Tascana 4. Amazing record. $75 minimum. Lot number 5867. Uh, flip side, Creep Along Moses. Both sides were great. But we only played one. $300 minimum bid for Dixieland Jug Blowers. Southern Shout. E plus condition. 5886. Uh, Jim Jackson, E plus, $250 for $58.92. Richard M. Jones, Jazz Wizards, African Hunch, $300 for $58.94. Sam Ku West, 
Harmony Boys, fifty-eight ninety-six for two fifty. Clifford Hayes Louisville Stompers, fifty-eight ninety-nine two hundred. Jimmy Rogers Anniversary Blue Yodel, that would be number seven, lot number fifty-nine fifteen for fifty dollars. For Duke Ellington, Shadam and Tilly, uh, fifty-nine thirty. Two hundred fifty dollars for Johnny Dodd's washboard band, Wary City Stomp, fifty-nine sixty-nine. Lot number fifty-nine seventy. Is DeFord Bailey harmonica solo ice water blues? We played this on the show. E condition for two hundred and fifty dollars. Lot number fifty-seven, fifty-nine seventy. That is fifty-nine seventy. Fifty-nine seventy-one for two hundred is King Oliver's Call of the Freaks. E condition. I wonder what that sounds like. Hey, we could find out. We could. Uh, that sounds like a request to me. Put that one aside. Fifty-nine seventy-three. Because I mean, if you can't listen to music while working in Oxford Records, I mean, what's the point? What's the point? I mean, like working at the zoo uh, in the gift shop. Hello. All right. Fifty-nine seventy-three. M minus condition. Four hundred hop by the Missourians. Five hundred dollar minimum bid. We played that on the show. For good reason. It was great. Wilton Crawley on clarinet. She's driving me wild. Fifty-nine seventy-four for two hundred fifty dollars. I'm still looking for that woman who's driving me wild. That's why we played Santa Claus, bring me a new woman on uh, Better Request Show. Fifty-nine seventy-seven, Clarence Williams, for two hundred fifty dollars. Bring me a new woman, but I don't want her to be a pain in the glass. Okay, good. Fifty-nine seventy-eight, two hundred fifty dollars. Walter Pichon. Doggin' that thing. Fifty nine eighty eight, seventy five bucks. Wadi da by the three keys. Okay, so that gets us out of the gym quality stuff. Okay, so we're going to go into our post war section, but don't leave if you're interested in gym quality stuff. I was thinking as we were going, where's all my really good stuff? Where's all the high dollar stuff? I mean, this is all good stuff. but um, And then it dawned on me, it's uh, back in an undisclosed location. In case anybody should ever break into Fort Knox, they're not going to find that stuff easily. Uh, so we're going to uh, go through the post-war stuff, and then we will go back into that. So starting with lot number 6028 on the state's label, we have James Bannister and his com uh, com combo doing Gold Digger. Uh, $75 minimum bid. Uh, 75 Superstition by uh, Big Ed for 6031. Uh, the Crystal Squeeze Me Baby on Luna, $50, 6062. Hundred dollars for Faith Douglas Trio on Ballad, sixty seventy four. Two hundred dollars for the El Rays, Darling I Know, sixty seventy seven. Two hundred dollars. I already say that. I probably already said that. I think I've been repeating myself. Five stars. Hundred dollars. Sixty eighty seven. Played two or three of these. Boyd Gilmore on Modern Hollywood. Sixty-one oh five, hundred and fifty dollars for sixty-one twenty-one by the Heartbreakers. Hundred dollars for sixty-one twenty-five by uh, music by Q Martine. The Hollywood Four Flames singing "I'll Always Be a Fool." A fool for you, but a fool. Two hundred fifty dollars, Milton label, Wright Holmes Alley Special. Slot number 6126. 6127 is $500 for the Hornets. 
Lonesome Baby. We played that one. Rockin' Daddy by Howlin' Wolf on chess. 6130, $250. This uh, is probably a, a, a DJ copy or at least out of a radio station because the, the file number that's stamped on the label. Not a DJ label specifically, but uh, probably came out of a radio station. Okay, we did play this. JB and his Hawks, five hundred dollars. This is JB Hutto on lot number sixty-one thirty-seven. Chance, now she's gone. Elmore James, sixty-one forty-four. Uh, on the flare label, fifty dollars. And here's another Elmore James. Or on this particular label, we have Elmer James. Trumpet, Gonna Find My Baby, $150 minimum bid, $61.47. $250 minimum bid by B.B. King, She's Dynamite, $61.55. $61.77, Joe Hill Lewis, When I Am Gone on Checker. This was recorded by Sam Phillips before the days of the Sun Studio. In fact, here's another Sun recording on the flip label by the Miller Sisters. $300 minimum bid for $6201. Now, who could that be? It's probably somebody making a request. Okay, $100 for a United labeled copy of Robert Nighthawk and his Nighthawks band doing Kansas City Blues on lot number 6209. 6210 Willie Nix $150 minimum bid The Peacheroos on Excello uh, $150 minimum bid lot 6220 James Reed on the money label 6240 for 100 bucks Oh people man I seem to say that to myself several times a day Crown Records, Key to My Heart by the Robins, $75, lot number 6245. Here's a record played on the show, $50 minimum bid, $6265, The Solitaires. What did she say? And a $500 minimum bid on Big Boy, Squ uh, Big Boy Spires uh, on the Chance label, $6272. And finally, Sunnyland Slim, sixty-two seventy-nine for seventy-five bucks opener. All right, so that gets us through that crate. Now, um, before we go with any other section, we're going to return back to uh, earlier uh, catalog lots of high dollar value from our secret cubby hole. And starting off with a Japanese recording, lot number 1346. This is a very, very early, uh, circa 1902, Columbia pressing with a brass grommet, which is what they were putting uh, around their spindle holes uh, at that time period. This is a copy of the earliest known American disc recording of Japanese music. Got that? So there may have been earlier uh, Japanese recordings on cylinder, and there are in the United States, recorded in the United States, but this is the earliest known disc recording from the United States in Japanese. And there were, uh, there's a run of numbers in this Matrix series, uh, only two of these apparently have turned up. This one, and then the one immediately following this, which is owned by one of our uh, bitter friends in Germany. So that is a very significant record. That's got a $2,500 minimum bid. We played that on the Bitter, Requo bitter Request Show, and actually it was quite nice. I was expecting a lot of, uh, you know, clanging around with kitchen utensils. But no, it was a... Uh, uh, male vocal uh, is a very uh, very attractive song. 
All right, lot number 5643 for $1,000. This is the Mississippi Sheik's Dead Wagon Blues. We played this on the show out of our gym quality section. Here is a $750 minimum bid Dixieland Jug Blowers on lot number 5885. E plus condition. Dealer stock. Those were the initials of a man that I had bought this record from. I know that they were dealer stock. I went through those dealer stock boxes that he hauled to a show uh, one year. I was fortunate to grab that one before somebody else did. Lot number 5893, $1,000 minimum bid by Floyd Ming and his Pep Steppers. Very uh, desirable recording in M minus condition. Yes, that's right. Flip side of that is Indian War Whoop. We've played both of those sides on the Bitter Request show now, so that record is officially retired. Clifford Gibson, Levy Camp Moan, $3,000 minimum, $59.79, E-plus condition. Uh, John Estes, $59.80, M-minus condition, $1,000 minimum. Take a look at it. Does that look M minus over there? It does to me, but I've never graded records, so. Yeah, well, that may be on her to-do list. We'll just have to see how it works out. If if she starts grading records, I'm sure she'll she'll be good at it. She's very conscientious. Fifty nine eighty one, lot number one thousand. She's also a hard butt. You don't get away with things, so uh, that's what you need when you're a record grader. All right, Caveman Blues, Memphis Jug Band. Oh, this is this is a record. You want to see a record? This is a record. Washington, A.K.A. Bucca White, Victor three eight six one five. I am in the heavenly way, and the promise, true and grand. This is uh. An M minus record, five thousand dollar minimum bid. We did play this on the bidder request show, and you should probably hear it. Okay, Kentucky Jazz Babies, Old Folks Shake, three eight six one six. What was this? Three eight six one five. Yeah, it's from a run of thirty eight thousand I bought a few years ago. Um, Fifty nine eighty three is a lot number. Fifteen hundred dollars is a minimum bid. We played this on the Bitter Request show too, and the the first part of this kind of sounds like the Darktown Strutters Ball to me. Lot number sixty fourteen, one thousand dollar minimum bid. Sunny Clay's Plantation Orchestra, Chicago Breakdown. Six six zero one four thousand dollars, and. Bringing up the rear is B.B. King's very first record on the bullet label for a $1,500 minimum. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, Groove, groove wear is very nice. It's a little scuffy, but a very nice condition record. Plays great. We played this on the show, and it sounded terrific. It graves E-. Um... Yeah, Miss Martha King, that was his first wife to whom he was married at the time when he recorded that record. We've got a tail end of uh, post-war. $150 minimum bid for the Swans doing It's a Must on Ballad. Lot number 6284. We played that one on the show. 6288. Playboy Thomas, no doubt about it, on Parrot. $200 for the Velveteers on Spitfire, $62.98, Do Wackadoo. No, I'm sorry, Boo Wackaboo. I'm getting that uh, confused with the Roger Miller's uh, tune. Uh, $62.99 in E condition, $250 minimum bid, the Vibranaires. On whatever that label is, after hours. And then we have uh, Chicken by Baby Boy Warren on Drummond. Uh, 6308 for a hundred bucks. 
Here's a Green Aristocrat Muddy Waters, Streamlined Woman, $63.09 for 100 bucks. And a Muddy Waters Chess for $150, $63.10. Chance, James Williamson, $63.20. Okay, so that covers everything but the stuff that we can't find, which we may just have to do without. We'll have to see. And then uh, we've got some diamond discs. So uh, we're going to take a short break here. You can uh, use this to follow along here in this uh, auction highlights reel, or you can use it to follow along in the Better Request Show. Speaking of which, Better Request Show is... Uh, well, by the time you see you're seeing this, it's either playing right now or it will be playing the following weekend or it's already over. But uh, whatever, you can at this point actually go on our website and download the playlist for the Bitter Request Show. So uh, you might want to do that. A lot, a lot of guys like to follow along with playlist as they listen to the show. Um, but it does take away a bit of the element of surprise. So you might not want to because there are some... Uh, there's some interesting things that we uh, we do on the show this time. All right, so let's uh, we're gonna do a little cleanup work here. We've got some records that uh, either we didn't get to or forgot about or that we're missing that we just located uh, that we would have co covered in the first two sections. We're gonna go ahead and uh, wipe them out right here, right quick. Lot number 1880 for a thousand dollar minimum bid is a record which we had in fact put into a list a number of catalogs ago with a $2,500 minimum bid, it did not sell. So we are relisting it this time for $1,000, which would be a real bargain for this disc. This is a Pantophone record by Mademoiselle Mathieu. We played this record uh, several years ago when we offered it the first time. We played the flip side this time. It's now officially retired from the Bitter Request show. You can see this record has the uh, artist's autograph inscribed in the wax, which is not unusual. There are a number of labels that was doing that, uh, were doing that. In fact, we saw Berliners in the first hour, uh, which are autographed in the wax. But anyway, that's a nice feature, and the star label is just fabulous. Uh, a very nice sounding record, in very good condition, very rare, very significant. So you um, should put that on your list of considerations if you are an opera collector. Here is a very significant record because this happens to be Leonard Bernstein's very first recording. This was done in May of 1941. Uh, here he is playing piano. Uh, he, it's not one of his compositions. He's not directing. He's just playing the piano. He was a very good pianist. Uh, Prelude and Fugue, number three in C sharp major by David Diamond, a, uh, a, an individual who is a contemporary of Bernstein's um, on a recording or on a label that uh, uh, specialized in recordings of contemporary artists that has a $75 minimum bid. It will not sell for $75. All right, and here is a 12 inch phonotypia by Franz von Fexi. Of the Devil, a Devil's Trill Sonata by Tar Tartini. We did play this side on the show. Uh, $100 minimum bid on that 1911 recording. Very respectable E condition uh, record. So, uh, again, a very nice piece for, for a violin collector. Now we're going to hop over to uh, a few more of the historical items in our World War II section that uh, remained on the shelf and... Uh, so we didn't see these. This is on the RAF label. Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund of USA. Uh, here is Winston Churchill speaking in the Voices of Democracy uh, series. $25 minimum bid for a two record set. Uh, this is lot number 3585. And the nice thing about this is it has this really nice original sleeve. Look at that. Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund record. Okay, so you have all these different individuals speaking on this two record set. Here is an appeal from uh, June uh, 1940 by General de Gaulle with a uh, $25 minimum bid, nice E minus condition. Uh, here's Dwight Eisenhower picture label. Um, 
D-Day Order of the Day in the Guildhall speech. That's lot number 3590. Uh, let's see here. A couple of uh, British uh, uh, records for uh, war bonds or fundraising, that sort of thing. Okay, here's something very interesting. This is Seaman Frank Laskier describes his experiences. We played all four sides of this two record 10 inch set on the bonus hour of the Bitter Request Show because this is worth listening to. Seaman Laskier turned out to be a very articulate, educated spokesman for the Merchant Navy in England during the World War II era. And uh, you'll find a lot about him on the internet. Uh, even compared to uh, Shakespeare in terms of his writing abilities. Uh, certainly a, a very interesting record. Uh, started out as a radio broadcast, and uh, there was such a huge response to this by the public that uh, it was decided to issue this and make it available on phonograph records. This is an interesting record, lot number 3602. Let me look at that right quick. 3602 is a general patent, or the famous general patent speech. But it's not read by Patton. It's read by uh, Gilbert Mack, who is introduced by William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. It's a uh, uh, George Patton speech to his troops prior to the invasion of Normandy in May 1944. I do not know if the Patton speech was recorded. Uh, I didn't really investigate that, so, I, so I'm not sure. But uh, if it wasn't, then the best we can do is just uh, have somebody recreate it. And that's what Gilbert Mack does here on this particular record with all the uh, profanities and everything that go along with that. We did not include this in the Bitter Request show simply because we just didn't have time. There was just way too much stuff. And why why should I p play a, you know, a faked recording when we have so many original recordings to play. So it didn't get played, but it's still worth listening to. All right, lot number 3603 is a uh, recording by Benito Mussolini, $25 minimum bid on the Discoteca uh, di Stato label, Record of the State. Uh, here's a 1945 Mother Goose Rhymes by Carson Robison, another Carson Robison wartime selection. Here is the Declaration of War from December 8, 1941 by Franklin Roosevelt on a label that doesn't turn out very often. Usually you find this on Red Label Columbia or uh, Victor, but uh, this is, I think, perhaps the first time I've had it on this particular issue. A grand $10 minimum bid on that. Here is a Parlophone record recorded about two months after Germany declared war on England. But anyway, uh, they were pretty quick in the recording studio. They recorded Adolf in 6-8 uh, time. And on this side they recorded They Can't Black Out the Moon. Refer referring, of course, to the blackouts in London from the uh, bombing. This is by Harry Roy and his orchestra with Wendy Clare on the vocal. And we played both sides of that record on the show. One side in the broadcast portion, one side in the bonus hours. This is The Challenge to, to Japan, a 1948 recording uh, by uh, Monsignor Fulton Sheen. Uh, on, uh, is that a, yeah, that's a Japanese Columbia label. Uh, here we have a uh, recording of uh, the rescue of 300 British prisoners from the Altmark by second engineer George King of the uh, by second engineer George King of the Doric Star. What the heck is that actually saying? Maybe I should just shut up and let you read the record. It says, Second Engineer George King of the Doric Star. Thank you. See, there you go. There you go. I'm getting old, people. Getting old. Somebody needs to come in here and take over this business. Yes, that's an offer. All right, here we have uh, President Truman's VE Day Address on a uh, white label pressing. I think that this red, white, and blue shield perhaps was added after the record was sold. Uh, $10 minimum bid on that. And here is a recording by uh, Ludwig Volker, 
who was with the Catholic Young Men's Association. He was arrested in 1936 by the Nazi Party for opposition to the Hitler Youth, along with a large number of other leading members. Um, speaking of which, we, uh, we also showed the uh, two swing recordings by Charlie and his orchestra. Swing was a big thing uh, in Germany during uh, that period of time, although it was against the law, certainly in terms of uh, uh, Negro or uh, Jewish performers or composers. And in fact, I just watched the movie Swing Kids again a couple of days ago, which kind of talks uh, about that story, the the, uh, the underground swing movement and dancing Lindy Hop movement going on in Nazi Germany and how that all came down. Certainly a movie worth watching. Uh, certainly isn't on the order of Schindler's List or anything, but still gives a pretty good representation, representation I think, of what things were like uh, during that period of time. Okay, let's get rid of these and we will now go into our third catalog section. Our first catalog section is 78s. And by catalog I'm referring to the printed catalog or the PDF that you see on the internet. So the first section is 78. Second section is Edison Diamond Disc. Third section is cylinders and fourth section is paper. So we're going to look at some diamond discs right quick. There's some very interesting, very interesting things here. Uh, this is lot number 6397, $100. Emma, Emma Johnson, Cold Weather Papa, 6407 for $100 Nashville Nightingale by the Charleston 7. Flip side of that, Tootles. 6140, $100 minimum bid, George Melodian's Rhythm of the Day. And, and everybody's Charleston Crazy. All right, $64.99, $250 minimum bid. All you get is a matrix number in the runout area. Nothing much to look at on this record. You got a recording on that side, slick back on that side. This is actually the Edison demonstration record. Uh, Edison diamond discs were introduced late 1912, 1913. And this was a record that was uh, produced for dealers and jobbers which uh, extolled the, all of the benefits of the Edison system, from the motor to the recording process, the records themselves, the natural tone, you know, you, 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 you get the drift. Uh, but it was actually a very, very good system, and it was totally Edison's own. It really didn't borrow much of anything from anyone else. Uh, lot number 6500 is uh, a $500 minimum bid record. You don't get any clue from the label as to what this is. It's uh, simply a blank label with a number written on it. The back, again, is slick. So uh, no information on the record. But what this is is the Harger and Blish, I think the fourth annual uh, sales contest that they sponsored. They were a Midwestern uh, uh, Edison jobber, and they put out a contest for their dealers in various states, Missouri, Kansas, uh, Iowa, so forth to uh, sell the most phonographs and so forth in a given period of time. And the winners got this grand tour up through Canada, down the eastern seaboard, into New York City, where they would actually go to a Ziegfeld Follies performance, something they probably wouldn't see in Iowa. And then uh, from there, they would head down to uh, the Edison Laboratory in New Jersey, where they would make their own record. This is the record that they made. And uh, I challenge you to find another copy of this. I don't even know if this et exists at the Edison National Laboratory, but it exists right here and it can be your yours if you submit the highest bid over $500. We did play that on the Bitter Request Show, so you don't have to buy the record to hear it. This is lot number 6502, another special pressing. While I Swan, sung by Al Bernard, this record specially manufactured for Mr. R.B. Alling, typewritten on the Edison label. Single-sided disc. I looked up who Mr. Alling was, now I forget, but he was, I think, associated with a company somewhere, and I think, in fact, that may have been in Detroit. But uh, regardless, uh, this particular section, uh, selection by Al Bernard 
was not issued on Diamond Disc, but it was issued on Blue Amberol. Apparently Mr. Alling had a Diamond Disc machine and he preferred it on that format and either he had enough pull with Mr. Edison uh, or the company or enough money to, to get his own personal copy of this on the disc format. Very cool record. Oh, by the way, I should mention this. This is a uh, this is kind of cool. On the Harger and Blish record, uh, you have the guys who were the winners. There were five winners. Three of them appear on the record, so maybe two of them weren't able to uh, to to make the trip, or maybe they were hungover from their night at the Follies. But whatever. Um, but after they finish speaking, uh, Vernon Dalhart comes on and sings a song written by uh, somebody associated with one of these companies and it wasn't a bad song either and uh so we have a uh, an unissued uh vernon dalhart song on this record it is in jack palmer's discography i checked so he was aware of that all right getting back to the business at hand 6508 is a diamond disc test pressing it uh is a easily uh identified as a test pressing because the edge is unfinished you can see that kind of, I, I guess you can see that, Raquel? Yes. All right, so that's an unfinished edge. It is stamped discarded, so uh, no longer uh, a valid record. Um, these are pieces by Arthur Middleton and Anna Case. I don't recall whether or not these pieces were issued, but the interesting thing about this record is what is uh, appears in... Uh, typewritten form on this uh, labels, craft label slug. And I'm going to read that because it's very hard to make out. Uh, 6508 in the catalog is where I'm going to go to do this. Well, uh, this is what it says. This discarded record is the property of Thomas A. Edison Incorporated, West Orange, New Jersey. Temporarily, it is loaned to an Edison employee who is not to sell it or loan it to others under penalty of immediate dismissal. Violating this... Uh, and that's all I can read. <laughs> so I don't know what violating this uh, is all about, but uh, we can pretty much assume, based on what we've already read, that it's not good news. You know, the goons will show up at your house and kick your door in and all that kind of business. So uh, don't mess with the record. All right, here we have a 10-inch uh, Edison long play. Edison long plays are just wonders of recorded sound technology. The 12-inch Edison long play is played for 45 minutes. Try that with your typical LP. All right, um, they have a uh, groove TPI threads per inch of 450 TPI, which is like a hair. Uh, a regular diamond disc has 150 TPI which is pretty close to what an LP is. So uh, the Edison technology of making these recordings was r really amazing. Unfortunately, however, the playback technology wasn't quite up to it, and uh, your Edison long play reproducers would rip up these records in very short order, which is why only 14 of them were ever produced before uh, Edison uh, shut down that particular operation. Too bad for those people who invented, invested in an Edison uh, long playing machine. Fortunately for them, they were also able to play regular diamond discs on that machine as well. Our last Edison disc is a 12 inch Edison sample record. We've seen these before. There are ser several different bands on either side of this disc, which play snippets from these uh, selections that are newly released by the Edison company and uh, therefore you could listen to those and place your orders accordingly. All right, those date from around 1926. We have, as usual, some pretty amazing cylinders in the catalog, a uh, number of which we played on the Bitter Request show and I would like to share a few of them with you. We're going to start with this particular record, this is the Isler's Orchestra cylinder with an uh, original record slip. Uh, it's the Flirtation March. Mm -hmm. So you can see here that we've got uh, a little bit of mold on there, but nothing really serious, and it sounds very good. 
uh, we grade cylinders, brown wax, uh, whether standard or concert cylinders, we grade uh, orally instead of vis visually. And so on a scale of one to nine, with nine being basically the way, the, cil the way I would imagine the cylinder sounded when it was brand new, um, this grades as a seven, so a very high grade. This is the original record slip that accompanied this cylinder, the Flirtation March by Isler's Orchestra. Isler was a uh, very prominent uh, band leader and recording artist during the uh, mid to late uh, 19 or 1890s. All right, next up is, I believe, a consolidated record. Oh, by, by the way, what's the minimum bid on that? $250. $250 on that with the uh, record slip. What's the minimum bid on this consolidated record? That is $50. $50. Okay, so this is Uncle Josh's trip to Coney Island uh, on a consolidated cylinder. Uh, again, this is just a company that was a uh, uh, not a big cylinder company. It was one of many that kind of got into the cylinder recording and issuing business uh, when they first started to, to catch the public's eye and people started investing in phonographs. And so uh, this grades five on that one to nine scale. So it's a uh, very clear and understandable, but you do, do hear some noise. Uh, caused by that uh, light uh, mold that covers most of the surface of the cylinder. Uh, but an Uncle Josh collector would be happy to add that to his collection, um, just as he would have been ha would be happy to add that uh, Berliner uh, Cal Stewart recording that we saw it in the, the first highlights reel. Those are both very early very rare Cal Stewart recordings. I surmise this is the original box. Here we have the lid with Coney Island written on it in pencil. Very typical of what you would see in this uh, day and age. Uh, and this blank box, which is a box that uh, is uh, uh, typically used for a lot of that kind of stuff in the 1890s. We have a section of cylinders in this catalog uh, that are Edison Bell indestructible phonograph records, uh, brown and black wax cylinders. So here is a brown wax example. These are just like a uh, Lambert cylinder that you would see in the U.S. It's basically just a celluloid shell with no core. Uh, and like a Lambert, uh, American Lambert, these are prone to shrinkage as well. Um, to that end, I... Uh, decided that I would figure out a way of describing how much these records have shrunk. So I grabbed an Archaea phone mandrel and I uh, inscribed lines on it uh, with this main ring here representing the end of a uh, nickel plated cylinder mandrel, cylinder machine mandrel. So if you had an Edison standard or home cylinder phonograph that would be the edge of the phonograph mandrel. So how far off the mandrel is this cylinder? When I slide it on, we can see this is one inch mark right here. So this is about uh, one and seven eighths inch extending off the edge of the mandrel. So that just kind of gives you an idea how much the record has shrunk. It's still entirely playable. It's just going to be difficult to play, especially if you have a machine with the end gate that closes that would keep the, uh, uh, the pivot from uh, engaging the mandrel on the right side so you really wouldn't be able to play it. You could only play a cylinder like this on one on a machine that didn't have an end gate and you would put the cylinder on just tight enough to hold it in place while the, uh, uh, record, the needle tracks across it. However, on a cylinder that's this far off, um, you may not be able to track all the way to the end of the selection. However, if you have a Columbia 20th century uh, cylinder machine that is designed to play the uh, 20th century uh, uh, three-minute uh, black wax cylinders, then, uh, then that mandrel would be long enough to accommodate any of these uh, Lamberts. So that's a, an example of a brown Lambert. This is an example of a black one, exactly the same thing, just black instead of brown. 
or pink in the case of those that were issued in the United States. All of them have the same uh, uh, Edison Bell indestructible boxes. They all have lids as far as I can recall. Some of the lids have the uh, correct number written on them. Some of them don't. But again, there was no label on the lid itself. It was just a handwritten number. So it's not that, uh, that important. Uh, this one happens to say Appleby Bookseller in Exmouth. So that is on uh, cylinder 408. What's the lot number on that? Let's see. Lot 6572. And what's the minimum bid on these? $25. All right, and some of them may be 50. But um, but the uh, that's the only lid I just noticed that uh, imprint of the bookseller's uh, store. That, that may be the only one of these that has that on it, if that happens to be important to you. All right, next we're going to uh, talk about, well, let's, let's, let me mention this first. Um, in the uh, Addison 2-Minute Wax Gold Molded uh, section, we have a number of boxes that have OBL with a little asterisk after them. The asterisk indicates that it's not really an original lid, but it's a lid that some guy has gone to the trouble to create these little uh, labels for the top that give the uh, actual uh, title and uh, artist or uh, type of selection, usually with a little bit of ornamentation to go along with it. You know, on a lot of these early lids, all you had was the number, either handwritten or stamped, on the lid, but no identifying information as to what the cylinder itself included. So this guy probably decided, well, let's do something about that, and let's just make up some nice lids for my cylinders, and that's what he did. These were just too nice to go unnoticed and unmentioned. So that's why if you see OBL with an asterisk, you're looking at one of these things. Uh, these are pretty much the same. But there are others that are different. There are some that use different color ink, uh, maybe per, uh, uh, red or blue, obviously black. Some of them are round. Some of them have the uh, information in a slightly different format. But they're all very uh, nicely attractive like that. All right, now let's go to this one. This is uh, uh, Edison 10333. This is the Polk Miller and his Old South Quartet doing old-time religion, a record we played on the Bitter Request show. Look at how nice that is. There's no mold on that, no scratches, a little dust from the inside of the box, and that's it. That is in beautiful shape. Very, very nice playing cylinder. It's got the original box and lid. So that's what that looks like. And I think that was, what, $150? Yep, lot 6894. $150 for this record would be way too low. That is not only a great record, but it is historically significant. Pope Miller was a Civil War veteran. So he was pretty old by the time that cylinder was made, which I think was around 1909. And, uh, and he toured around with a troupe of black minstrels, and they did shows all over. And uh, Mark Twain said something on the order of they are, they are the most American... Uh, act or whatever that he has ever even heard. He, he just went over the top with it. So uh, if Mark Twain thought it was that good, it's probably pretty good. Uh, I know it's good because I helped uh, my buddy Ken Flaherty, who is now living in the Detroit area, to put together a CD reissue of Polk Miller stuff, which wound up gaining us a Grammy nomination. And a whole trip to Los Angeles and the Staples Center and the whole hoo-ha that goes along with that. So, I mean, uh, God has really blessed me in this business. I've had some experiences which uh, probably wouldn't have come my way if I had done something else with my life. So that, that was pretty cool. All right, getting back to uh, this, uh, cylinders. We're looking here at an Edison cylinder, which is part of the Grand Opera series. So the boxes we just looked at had red printing. The Grand Opera series has blue printing, so they're very easy to tell, and it says Grand Opera right here at the top. These were numbered in a B catalog series, B prefix, so this is B2, as you can see here. You got that? Yep. By Air Dipple. And uh, 
condition of the cylinder is likewise just really really nice look at that just beautiful 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 and it's going to play very well i had wanted to play this in the auction bitter request show and there again i think we just did not have the time most of the cylinders we played in this show were concert cylinders which we're going to be getting here getting to here shortly because it was just unbelievable drop dead type material and so we had to go with that we have a small group of uh, uh, foreign issue cylinders this is a clarion uh, clarion number 2886 harry fay i'm afraid to come home in the dark uh, what's the lot number on that lot 7013 7013 minimum bid 15 dollars and again it's in very very nice shape a couple of very tiny molds of mold spots but nothing to be objectionable uh, the cylinder does not have its lid but that's what a clarion box looks like then we have a Pathé AICC cylinder on the top it just says Pathé but on the rim of the cylinder it will say Anglo-Italian Commerce Company uh, same number 81207 Mia Regina this one unfortunately does have some mold as we can see there it's pretty heavy on one side but mark writes on his grading slip very loud plays very well in spite of mold so there you have it your uh, Caruso cylinders were also uh, recorded by the Anglo Italian Commerce Company um, and uh, and were issued under that imprint all right here is a sterling record what is our sterling record uh 326 lot number 70 17 with a minimum bid of 25 dollars there you have it again very very nice clean condition with that i probably would have played that in the show had i paid attention to it and had we had time that's paragraphs sung by george foster have no idea what that means but it's probably a very cute play on words. All right. Uh, now let's go to our blue amber all. So some of you remember a couple of catalogs back, we had a large selection of Edison diamond discs, all of which came in reproduction sleeves. These were not just any old reproduction sleeves. And those of you who watched the uh, bitter request or the uh, auction highlights reels for that particular auction, uh, saw what those sleeves look like. They were stunning. They were so pretty. Uh, good, stiff, quality paper with the Edison design uh, perfectly registered on them. Printing was great. Construction was great. They were really, really nice. Uh, I would prefer them over Edison, original Edison uh, sleeves any day of the week. Well, I also bought a collection of blue amberols from the same individual. And he did the same thing with his blue emeralds. I mean, who of us likes the uh, original Edison uh, blue emerald lids? Um, it's very hard to find those early blue emerald lids that actually look nice and are still intact and doing their job. So he just decided to, to say the heck with the whole thing. I'm going to start over and I'm going to make good lids. And so he did. Look at this lid. If you were to just see this, even up close, you would assume that this was virtually a, an Edison lid that had been hermetically sealed in mylar for the last hundred years. It's not. This is a reproduction lid. Look at that, the typeface on this and everything. Uh, Raquel has, she has lauded and cleaned a lot of blue amber cylinders in her short tenure here at Knox. What do you think of these blue amber lids? Raquel! Their condition is far beyond what we see in terms of original box lids coming through here, but they're true representations of what they were supposed to look like. See that? I should, next time, maybe she's going to be doing a video. Uh, that was just awesome. All right, so that's what it looks like on the inside. So it's clearly the reproduction, but uh, much nicer than any Edison lid you're going to find. Uh, so the later lids were a little different. They, the later lids were the little cap lids instead of these that fit snug over that box. Uh, he didn't actually make cap lids. He made the same kind of lids as he was making here, but he did use the later uh, lid label. So it's, uh, you can 
those of you who collect blue amberols certainly know the difference there. Uh, so he just used the, the later label in the same typeface and everything, but put it on the same kind of lid. And uh, nothing wrong with that. Here is uh, one for a Mexican series cylinder that he did up in the 22,000 series. So all of these are cylinders that are listed in the current catalog. Uh, here is uh, actually a reproduction box that he used. Some of his cylinders are in reproduction boxes. Um, some are in original boxes, but it's the lids that we particularly want to point out. So what would he do with the 28,000 series concert cylinder, A? Eh? I mean, would he use that kind of lid on that? Well, that would be kind of really falling down on the job. Why put all the effort into that just to mess up on 28,000s? No, he's going to do it right. So look at this. Is that not killer or what? Boy, if this guy ever was meet Don Wilson, we'd all be in a bunch of trouble. Nobody would have any idea who had real stuff and who didn't. This is a uh, concert lid, brand new, on the original Edison concert box. So, he also did some for his purple amberols. Those will probably be coming up in auction 75 in the spring. And also for... Uh, four minute wax. I typically don't like to sell four minute wax cylinders in the fall auction because they're very uh, uh, fragile and can easily crack due to temporary uh, temperature change and in the winter time shipping center, uh, cylinders they go from a hot building to the cold air in a delivery truck or the hold of an airplane or something and there's just more opportunity for that very fragile four minute wax to break. So I usually only run those in the spring. So we'll be selling uh, four minute wax, purple amberols, and probably more blue amberols in the spring with those same kinds of uh, reproduction lids. Okay, that brings us to the end of the standard size cylinders. We're gonna close the cylinder uh, portion of this hour, not hour, it's way more than an hour, of this, uh, third auction reel with our concert cylinders. So turn back a couple of pages in the catalog to the concert cylinder uh, section. It comes right after the uh, uh, brown wax. Lot numbers 6555 and 6556 are both listed as being custom recordings, student question mark band. I say question mark because I really can't tell you, but listening to them, they are not professional. But they are better than your average student band, at least high school. In one of the announcements, I hear them saying, I hear the announcer saying something like first year. Uh, as we played one of these on the Bitter Request Show, and Mark uh, commented that that's way too good for a first year high school band, so we think it's a first year college band. Probably in the St. Louis area. I bought these in St. Louis. They all came out of this collection where uh, boxes, or at least the concert boxes, were shellacked originally by the owner, that is. And, uh, and there was a, uh, a couple of cylinders, you may recall, from uh, one or two auctions back that were played or recorded uh, in reference to the St. Louis 1904 uh, uh, exposition. So... Uh, so I'm thinking that these also came out of an exposition and probably or possibly the 1899 St. Louis exposition. St. Louis had expositions on a regular basis. The 1904 was a very special one. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why 1899 in a minute. But uh, if we look at these, you'll see that each of them say just March Band on a tag that's been applied to the uh, cylinder lid. Uh, obviously handwritten by an owner. It didn't come that way from either Edison or Columbia. But uh, these are very good quality recordings. Uh, cylinders are in great shape. I gave these, um, each of these I gave a nine on a scale of one to nine. These are nines. These are really, really good recordings. And uh, uh, pretty loud. This one right here has a tuba front and center. They should have moved him back a ways. He really comes through. 
but it doesn't blast too much. So, uh, so that's nice. Um, how often are you going to find uh, school band recordings on concert cylinders from the turn of the last century? I can tell you by experience, not very often. Now the reason I think that there's a good chance that those might have been recorded possibly at a St. Louis exposition and specifically an 1899 uh, exposition is because of this cylinder. Once again, a shellac box with the same type of label attached to the top with the same writing and what does it say? What do you think of Houlihan? Sung by Arthur Collins at St. Louis Exposition, 1899. Now, that will get the juices flowing of virtually any record collector who knows anything about records. You don't have to be a collector of cylinders or a collector of early acoustic material to understand that this is a significant cylinder. Arthur Collins was one of the greatest, probably a top five recording artists uh, in the first portion of the, uh, the 20th century. Um, Collins and Harlan. How many records by Collins and Harlan have we run across? Hundreds, maybe thousands. Um, they were very prolific and on all the major labels and some minor ones as well. This is that cylinder. Look at that. Condition is just fabulous. You can tell how much is going on in a groove. It's a very loud, very distinct cylinder. It's got a little bit of mold right here on the end. I don't even know if that goes into the recording. I don't think you can hear it. Um, this is just wonderful. Again, we grade this a 9 on a scale of 1 to 9. For a known artist to have made a custom recording like this at the exposition causes me to think that there was very possibly, if not likely, a recording booth set up there at the exp exposition for people to come in and make their own records. I mean, why not? Uh, the whole idea of records in 1899 and recording your voice was a huge novelty to, to the vast majority of American citizens. Um, in 1901 at the Buffalo Exposition, uh, there were little <coughs> napkin ring cylinders that you could actually record uh, your voice on and then mail those to somebody as a vocal snapshot of your attendance at the fair as a souvenir. So why wouldn't they have done largely the same thing in 1899? And the, and the announcement on the cylinder matches what's on the lid here. This is a special recording done by Arthur Collins at this fair. So if that was done at the fair, why wouldn't these other things have been done at the fair as well? A special booth set up for uh, for the public to come in, pay some money, and have a, a recording done. Back again. Raquel and I needed a water break. Mmm. Wow. You know that's pure spring water right out of my well. From my aquifer to you. Cheers. All right. Very good. Okay, lot 6558. Uh, this is worth mentioning. This is the uh, Burke and Rouse cylinder. It's in a Columbia box, but this is not a Columbia cylinder. Burke and Rouse was another one of those small companies like Consolidated that was producing records that uh, were, of course, targeting the market for uh, people who had just purchased their new uh, cylinder phonographs. So uh, it was kind of difficult to get into the phonograph making business but pretty easy to get into the cylinder making business because all you had to do is buy a few blanks and uh, get somebody to come in and record for you. And that's what's going on here. We have uh, Burke and Rouse on Fifth Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, the song title is Welcome as the Flowers in May. And that is sung by Mr. Albert Campbell, another very prominent recording artist. And here recording for the local Brooklyn company, Burke and Rouse. The announcement on this cylinder says B&R, B&R record. So uh, to have the original slip to go with this is very nice and very important. And by the way, that also grades 9 and has no mold. A couple of very small mold spots and uh, scratches, but nothing... Uh, nothing prominent. The minimum bid is $500. Okay. 
Uh, you'll note here in the catalog that I mentioned the fact that Jim Walsh, who uh, wrote all those wonderful articles and hobbies decades ago, uh, says that Rouse, as in uh, uh, Burke and Rouse, that Rouse happened to be the brother of Samuel Holland Rouse, better known to us as S.H. Dudley. Uh, another uh, very, very well-known and widely recorded recording artist from the uh, 1890s and early 1900s. So our next cylinder on the list of concerts is cylinder number, uh, lot number 6559. Oh my goodness, this is a biggie. This is a, uh, this is a Bettini concert cylinder in the original Bettini box in very nice condition. Look at the condition of this cylinder here. Just wonderful. It's got a few very small mold spots on it, but it sounds great. Uh, we played this one. In fact, we've played most everything I've just talked about on the Bitter Request show. This is by a Gypsy Orchestra, uh, and we graded this 7 to 8 or a 7.5 on the uh, scale. Uh, they're doing the Mazzantini March by Cervantes. Uh, how do we know that? Well, he does mention it in the announcement. And even though the uh, typewritten printing on this record slip, with original slip attached to the box, has mostly faded, uh, with the right light, right angle, and a magnifying glass, you can make out some of the letters in that. So we do have uh, solid confirmation that the slip and the box do in fact match the cylinder inside. This cylinder was purchased by me from the uh, uh, John Paul Getty Jr. collection of operatic recordings that was sold off at auction in London uh, years ago. I bought a lot of uh, some of the really nice pieces out of that collection including the Bettini cylinders, or most of the Bettini cylinders that he had. Unfortunately, this particular one is not a, uh, a high-flying opera singer, but still, it is a Bettini cylinder, concert Bettini cylinder, in beautiful shape, and therefore is uh, going to bring substantially more than the uh, simple, was it $1,000 that I have on this? I don't even know where I come up with some of these figures. This should have had a $2,500 minimum bid on it. This is a Bettini, original Bettini cylinder in beautiful condition with the original slip, with the record in beautiful condition matching everything else. Any Bettini in an original box with the original slip in beautiful condition, it plays well, should be a $2,500 minimum bid item. What was I thinking? What was I thinking, Raquel? You were thinking $1,000. <sighs> Lot number 6560, is this worth mentioning? Oh yeah. This is a Columbia 15193, selections from Yankee Doodle Dandy. Um, 120 RPM recording. Uh, nothing particularly uh, cool or interesting about that. But what is interesting is, look at that. Very light cream colored wax. That's the way... Lucinda's coffee looks once she's finished fixing it up. Um, almost milky white. Uh, but what's, uh, what's interesting about this is not the color of the cylinder wax, but the announcement. You think about it. I've been sitting here talking all day long on this video. I can hardly speak now. Um, my voice is hoarse. I'm saying things that I don't even mean to say. I stick words in where they don't belong. This guy is sitting here all day long, every two and a half minutes, giving an announcement. Sometimes it's the same announcement over and over. And how old would that get? I mean, let's say he did, you know, 20, 20 25 uh, in an hour. That's, I guess, probably take a little bit more setup time between cylinders and that. But still, I mean, all day long, he's going to be saying that over and over. And what should have come out Columbia came out Colonial. And the first time I played this record, I listened to it, it was like, oh, long day, my ears are playing tricks on me. I swore that guy said Colonial. I replayed it. Wait a minute. Played it two or three, four times. 
got on my knees in front of the speaker. Every single time it was colonial. I played it for Mark. He says, that's colonial. It's colonial. We played this on the Bitter Request Show. You can confirm that he says colonial orchestra, but it's clearly a Columbia cylinder. So, uh, very, very cool record. Very, it's just, you know, one more example of the wonderful things that we can find on uh, these early uh, Berliner and Brown Wax recordings. This is lot number 6561. Okay, this is the shellac box. Came from that St. Louis collection. This is the uh, address of the late President McKinley at the Pan American Exposition, which would have been the Buffalo Exposition of 1901, where he was assassinated. Um, not anything particularly special because uh, this was an issued uh, recording, the, uh, the, address, the last address of uh, President McKinley was uh, uh, issued on cylinder and disc by all the major companies, but it's in pretty nice shape. It's nice to find it as a concert cylinder, and I actually did some research on this uh, piece because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't, I mean, given that Arthur Collins cylinder, is it possible, because it's not announced, that this might actually have been McKinley speaking, um, maybe in a setup thing to record it at the, at the World's Fair in 1901? Uh, I mean, I don't know. When you get into this kind of stuff, anything remains a possibility. So I did a lot of research on this cylinder, and I came up with the uh, pretty strong conclusion that no, that is not the case, that this was just a studio recreation. I was able to uh, identify passages in the speech and compare it to other issues of the speech, which used much of the same verbiage. Uh, some, some versions take something out of this paragraph, some take it out of this paragraph. So there are variations in the speech from one company in one issue to another. So that was interesting to, to learn. But, uh, but this isn't actually McKinley. However, most of the labels and companies that were issuing this speech kind of, I think, wanted you to think that it might have been McKinley. They didn't really come out and say it was McKinley, but they, they wrote the label or the, the catalog entry to suggest it was addressed by the late President McKinley. You know, not Lynn Spencer or Harry Spencer reading the address. No, you're not going to see that. You're going to see something that indicates that it's actually President McKinley. So you're going to sell a lot more records that way. 6562 is next in your catalog. This is a, a, a Paris cylinder. And it is... Uh, yes, OBL. So what we see here is Alleluia d'Amour, uh, written on the lid, and we have the same thing announced on the cylinder itself. All right, there's your brown wax cylinder, some very, very light mold spots, but otherwise in, in beautiful condition. Um, grading a five to six on the scale. Uh, there are people who collect, of course, cylinder boxes, cylinder lids. That's a very nice uh, concert cylinder lid. So uh, this has uh, got a minimum bid of a mere $50. Uh, somebody will be very happy with that record. Next page, Fife and Drum Corps. Um, I played that on the Bitter Request Show. It's a nine. It's beautiful. Uh, even though you've got drums and the fife, uh, there's no distortion in it. It's a very, very loud and clear recording. Uh, it's very unusual to find a selection of that nature without distortion on the high notes, so it wasn't played very much. Uh, it's got the original box and lid as well as the, as well as the original record slip. Uh, and you can hear what sounds to be like somebody counting off uh, before the announcement and the selection starts. Uh, I do do need to make a correction here. It says 160 RPM. It is definitely not 160. This record was issued before 160 was even being used as a speed. Uh, we put that on the Archaea phone. It plays at 144. Just to uh, get that clear. Uh, next one. We're not going to look at that. It's kind of cool. 
accordion solo Kimball March, played by the composer Mr. John J. Kimball, Edison Record. That's the announcement. So it's neat to have that little extra flourish in the announcement talking about the composer. Uh, all right, so the next one we want to look at is lot number 6567, which is a uh, Pink Lambert, Raff's Cavatina. Pink Lambert concert cylinders typically will bring... Um, Oh, between $1,500 and $2,500, especially if it has an original box with it. This does not. Uh, and this cylinder doesn't look bad as long as you look at it from this angle. But if we move it around, we see that we have a cylinder that's been hit by a shaver. So a machine like a Triumph, or in this case a concert machine, could have had a shaver attachment on the uh, tone arm. Uh, the carriage arm, which if it's if it's lowered into position, you drop that thing down, and that shaver blade is going to hit your cylinder, and uh, and cause major problems. Uh, certainly on a wax cylinder, but even on a celluloid cylinder, you can see what it does. And I tell you what, that guy just wouldn't quit. He, <laughs> I guess maybe it was somebody who didn't know anything about shavers and kept trying to play the cylinder not knowing why it wouldn't play, and kind of pushing down on it in order to get that stylus engaged. And the whole time he's sitting here just carving pieces out of the cylinder. Um, in spite of that, the cylinder does play. Uh, let's see what we say here. Uh, mostly plays through. Not all of them are going to play through entirely, but since you're since your machine is on a feed screw, the machine is moving that stylus across. So even if it tends to uh, repeat in some places, it will pick it up and continue to, to, to go on. Um, but the neat thing about it is you can have that on a machine or have it on the wall, put the bad side to the back, and it looks like a perfectly good pink Lambert. So it's a nice display item at the very least. And at the minimum bid of a mere... $200, uh, somebody will be very happy to add that to their collection. Okay, let's go to lot number 6568. 6568 is a Pathé cylinder with a typical Pathé pebble box and a typical Pathé lid. Uh, this lid does match the cylinder inside by Marichal. Uh, uh, I'm not going to attempt to uh, uh, enunciate that uh, French title uh, and embarrass myself here in front of uh, Raquel and the entire world, so uh, I'll let you just read that for yourself. And uh, let's look inside the box. What's special about this, and the reason I bring it to your attention in the highlight reel is because on this Pathé cylinder right here you can see it says Pathé and it has uh, Marichal's name and the uh, title right here. So you can see that this is in fact the cylinder that uh, is mentioned on the lid so it's in the right box but the curious thing is this wording right here it says Phono Cinema. So when I found this I'm thinking Whoa, have I stumbled across a soundtrack for a film? Because that is what the Phono Cinema uh, system was all about. So I contacted my friend Henri Chamou in uh, Paris, the maker of the Archeophone, and uh, I asked him about this, and we engaged in a fairly lengthy uh, email chain concerning the history behind all of this, and I don't have time to get into it here, but uh, basically uh, there was something called the Phono Cinema Theater uh, in 1900 and 1901, which did produce a number of short films using 35 millimeter film strips driven by a central perforation synced up to a massive Celeste sized cylinder. I've got a Celeste back there, and it's a, like a two-minute wax cylinder that's about this long and this big around like a like two concert cylinders stacked up on each other. Really a amazing looking record. Um, and those have actually been, some of those have been found. They have been synced up and you can actually see them on the internet. Um, 
But he told me that in 1904, Pathé recorded and issued a number of concert cylinders bearing the designation Pathé Cinema on the Edge, which is what we just uh, saw. And uh, though one would expect that films were made to accompany those records, no surviving reels have been found and no indication that they ever existed to begin with. So uh, not exactly sure why that was done, but uh, I appreciate uh, Henri for uh, his uh, uh, helpful information so I could properly describe what I have here. And then the last... Uh, I guess the last record that we're going to look at for this highlight reel is lot number 6569. Another French concert cylinder. And uh, a nice lid. Uh, the Louvre Paris. Nice lion sitting here at the base of the L. Uh, whatever had been in the box is scratched out and a new title written over that. So this is not an OBL. It's just a nice box and lid. Uh, does the uh, cylinder inside match what that says? I don't know because the cylinder, as you can see, is broken in half. Now it's a pretty clean break and my friend Michael Conchali and the cylinder doctor in Monrovia, California could actually put this thing back together and it would play. Uh, but I'm not going to try to play it. So whatever is on that cylinder is what you wind up with. Maybe it's original to the box, maybe it isn't. Uh, basically, you're buying this for the box and you get the two halves uh, as a bonus. So that covers our cylinder section. Now I'm going to uh, briefly reset and we're going to show you a few really nice paper lots including some very nice cylinder catalogs and then we will uh, call it a wrap so we'll come right back to this reel back in a moment okay so here we have uh, the paper part this is section four in the auction catalog again we're going to go through this very quickly now here's the deal about this we have not even finished lotting records yet so we certainly have not uh, turned our attention to paper. So I've just grabbed these piles of catalogs off the shelf. I assume that they are all in the auction. I assume that these are the actual copies that we have listed in the auction. Uh, it's a possibility that they may not be, but I don't think so. If you follow along in the catalog, you can pretty much identify uh, what I'm showing you with the corresponding lot number in the catalog so that you'll be able to bid uh, properly. We're going to start with Edison Cylinders. So uh, I, I may not have uh, the date of the cylinder catalog here in front of me as I'm showing it to you. So I'm just going to show you one by one what these catalogs look like. So uh, these are cylinder catalogs. And uh, your early Edison cylinder catalogs are pretty collectible. All right, again, if you want to know what the uh, date is on these, refer to the catalog. Here's a blue, early blue amber all record catalog list. That's very nice. Um, now this is exceptional. This is a mint dealer stock Edison Diamond Disc record catalog. Look at this. Look at the, the beautiful color on that. Look at these glorious... You're probably getting all kinds of whacked out things in your uh, screen, aren't you? Nope. No? Picking right up. Okay, so uh, really nice catalog. No writing, no tears, no nothing. Uh, just an early Edison Diamond Disc list. So somebody's going to want that. Heck, for that matter, I want that. But uh, we'll leave it, leave it go. Here's another one, which is the uh, same, same front. But I believe that this is actually a different catalog. Okay, here we have a date, October 14, on that one. And the same kind of a situation. Oh, we do have somebody made some little pencil notations next to some cylinders. But they did it very carefully, and you could even probably erase those if you wanted to. But again, just a really, really clean copy. So, what, what was the date on that, 1914? see what this one is. 
February of 14. So it's a little earlier in the year. All right. And here's yet another. This one is November of 1915. So you'll see all of this represented in your catalog with the actual date. Now we get into a, a little later period when they weren't using all these glorious uh, metallic gold uh, printing and all that jazz. Okay. And now we get into more of a book form where we've got enough so that instead of saddle stitching it, we've got uh, perfect bound copies. Um, Edison Amber All Records. Edison Recreations. Edison Amber All Records. Here's a picture of an Edison, or it's on both sides. Uh, a uh, Edison looks like a uh, Model 50 uh, Edison uh, machine. There's a 1922 list. That one's in really nice condition. 1924 list. Here is a uh, hardbound uh, annual, can you read that? It says annual record catalog January 1923. So this is an original hardbound copy of a catalog with a little hole up here that you could hang it by a cord in your shop so people could look at it without walking out with it. All right, here we have uh, another another Golden Treasury of Edison Blue Hamberall Records. Was that a child's Golden Treasury by any chance? Probably not. Edison Dealer Supplement. Uh -huh. And finally this one. I think, that's, I think that's like a 1927 catalog. Anyway, um, so that's the listing of the Edison catalogs that we have in this auction. Now, we're not going to look at the DECA because, you know, DECA's a little bit later and they're not really terribly rare. Uh, so we're not going to spend our time looking at that, but we will quickly flip through the Parlophones since these are foreign and uh, not often seen here in the States. So again, going from older to newer. So we have this one and this one. 1931-32, These were tough years uh, overseas as well. This Depression era stuff both in uh, America as well as overseas, is uh, you know scarcer material than you're going to find in other per parts or other uh, time periods of recorded sound. Parlophone and Odeon, they were uh, kind of sister labels. Okay, now. The very last section of the paper in the catalog has to do with some items from uh, the Caruso Museum. These have also not been lotted. These are basically just the way I received them from the, uh, from the museum. And they don't look terribly nice but in this situation it's not so much how they look it's what they are these are original scores owned by Caruso himself look here Enrico Caruso gold stamped on the front cover of this and what is this this is the operatic score 
for uh, the Huguenot. This is uh, Meyer Beer's opera. And in here we have Enrico Caruso's autograph at the top. And inside of these uh, scores you will find penciled or wax pencil notations uh, by Caruso. Oh, look at that. Just a, just a note from uh, Mr. Caruso. It didn't say anything on there. Get that out of here. Um, we see some penciled notations uh, of just things that he wanted to be aware of, draws attention to in the score. Of course, by this time, he was very familiar with uh, the roles that most of these uh, have, so they're not heavily marked up as they might have been if it was a brand new score that he had not uh, performed in the past. But nevertheless, they are very well worn, and he these would have spent a lot of time in his possession. So uh, to have an original opera score of Caruso's is a significant thing. Um, some of them have the gold stamp on the front, some of them do not. Um, Manon Lascaux. All of them, however, were his. Some of these actually will have some little drawings, as we know, as you most of you know, Caruso was a uh, an artist of uh, real repute. Here we see uh, some of the same markings we saw in the previous with the, his little blue checks, which probably meant uh, passages where he was singing. Uh, I would presume I'm not a, a musician, so I don't really read music too well. Um, Pearl Fisher's here. Anyway, there's one with the uh, stamp on the front. Here's another, and so forth. So, I present these for your uh, consideration in the auction. Uh, they're more uh, uh, well described in the catalogs themselves in terms of what's going on with each one of those. So you'll have a better idea what you're bidding on. However, what you what you should take away from this is simply the fact that these are used. These are not scores that just sat on his shelf. These are scores that he actually used. And uh, that makes them so much more interesting and valuable, I think, in my opinion, than if they were just brand new that somebody had given them and he just put it on the shelf and never looked at it. Kind of like I told Mark when we were recording the show, it's kind of like uh, you could have, you know, a, a baseball gl a glove that somebody gave to Mickey Mantle and he said oh that's very nice and tossed it in the toy box for his kids to play with or you could have an authentic game worn glove which is going to bring what ten twenty fifty thousand uh, dollars much better have the the jersey that uh, Michael Jordan sweated in during a game than to have one with his name on it that you bought at Walmart all right here is a uh, a book of caricatures. Uh, this just shows many of the caricatures that Caruso drew. Uh, much of this material was printed in La Folia, an Italian magazine based in New York City. And uh, these are opera singers. In fact, I think I actually may have this one right here in the back. Um, a lot of these caricatures were were by uh, op were of opera singers. It's getting late, Raquel. Uh, opera singers, impresarios, uh, stage managers, people in the uh, trade in the industry, composers, instrumentalists, and so forth. But he also was drawing politicians and uh, the guy at the front desk of the hotel, the waitress at the restaurant that uh, he frequented, whatever. These are all some that are in the current catalog. Uh, again, in the back. Uh, this is an ident the identity of who the person is. It's listed in a book, maybe this one right here even, 1914 edition of the book on page 120. You will actually find this. This is the actual uh, drawing that was used for the magazine or for the book. These are real original drawings. Here's another one. The uh, Marquis Papalavto, that's uh, appearing in the 1914 edition on page 157. 
And these are all notations that uh, Aldo uh, made, and he had these hanging in the museum with this explanatory uh, tag on it. Antonio Venuto, uh, 1914 book. This is uh, dated 1907 is when he did this caricature. Uh, original caricatures by Caruso are very pricey, and typically, depending on the artist and the quality and the size, not the artist, the subject, the quality and the size, uh, usually go for several hundred dollars up to... Uh, well, I've got one of Teddy Roosevelt back there that I paid, I think, $4,000 for just two or three years ago. So, uh, so they don't come cheap. Uh, but this is a great opportunity to pick up uh, some real authentic uh, Caruso material at uh, hopefully a very reasonable price. So I would encourage you, if you've got interest in this sort of stuff, to bid on it. Uh, there will be more of these coming up in the future as I process my way through the collection. This one says it's Alfred Peck. I don't know who Alfred Peck was, but uh, that's who, who this gentleman uh, represents. So, that at long last brings us to the end of the uh, three uh, Knox Vintage Records Vintage Record Auction 74 highlight reels. And I want to thank uh, the lovely, talented, and ever gracious uh, Raquel Marsh for her help uh, today. And I know she's going to do a fabulous job with editing these videos and getting them up and uploaded so that you guys will be able to access them uh, once the Bitter Request start, show starts airing, which is this coming Saturday morning. Uh, again, this is our catalog, Auction 74. You can get that right he down here. The website is 78rpm.com. And uh, there you will be able to not only download a PDF copy of the auction, but you will also be able to pull up past auctions with the unsold list and purchase records that were not bid upon. And other auctions, you can buy those for the min minimum bid amount if they are still available. Uh, you will also... Find on our website the resource catalog where you can buy discophile record sleeves. All these record sleeves that you see up here are discophiles. We make these. Uh, we've got about 350,000 of these showing up in the next week or two. And hopefully we're going to have our 12-inch size back, which we've been out of now for over a year as I've been waiting for paper prices to come down so I wouldn't have to raise prices on you guys for the 12-inch size. So it looks like that has been accomplished. I'm just waiting for them to get it wrapped up and get them shipped over here. So uh, we're going to have a big party here when those things show up because I'm going to have a whole lot of pallets of record sleeves going out to the street that Raquel and I are going to need to do something with. But uh, if you're interested in record sleeves, uh, just submit that order with your bid sheet and feel free to go ahead and add in your 12 inch because I pray and have high hopes that those things will be here by the time we start packing boxes. I know I've been promising that now for about two and a half months, but uh, this world that we live in, nothing happens when you want it to. It's, uh, it's just, as you know, one thing after another. Things are not getting better. But anyway, uh, we, we uh, plow on through and do the best we can. We work together and we make it happen. So thank you very much for, uh, for paying attention. Those, you know, three of you guys that are still left at the end of the third video, if you're awake and still with us, thank you for watching. Uh, feel free to comment on the uh, videos on YouTube. And if you've got any questions, uh, I look at that periodically, and I'll be happy to answer your questions uh, when I do so. So again, thank you very much. Remember, Knox Vintage Records' motto, bid early, bid high, and bid often. It's a little late to be bidding early, but you can still do high and often. Make up for early. Thank you very much. We'll catch you on the flip side.